I grew up playing soccer when I was four and was able to get a college scholarship. Uh, played four years and then at the end was just didn't want to give it up so I decided to go into coaching and stay with soccer. Uh, it was my love so I just kept going and we ended up coaching for about 30 years at the Division One level and then I have now gone over and become a professional scout. When Kat and I were first dating, it was important to me to attend one of her soccer matches to see how she spoke with her players and how she connected with them. And I could tell by the way she interacted, she cared about them beyond the sport. Kat cared about them as people. Kim is my rock and she's just that person I can go to whenever I need support, encouragement, or just a big hug and to be told that it's gonna be okay. When we decided to get married, we were looking at dates possibly in November, but Kat woke up a couple of days before we were married and there were curls on her pillow. And she said, I wanted to get married before I lost my hair. We ended up getting married at the courthouse, just a small, intimate session with uh, my family, and we just celebrated afterwards with each other. And that night, I helped her take her hair down to um, a shorter length. My name is Kat, and I have ovarian cancer. This is one of those cancers that has really vague, subtle symptoms until it's advanced. That's why we call it the whisper disease. So the sooner the investigational process starts, potentially the better the outcome. The first sign I felt during ovarian cancer was the bloating. And it was very unusual for her to um, be so self-conscious about the bloating and I began to become concerned. Really, we want to think about bloating, uh, increased abdominal girth, um, urinary change in urinary symptoms and bowel and bladder habits, um, heightened uh, sense of um, indigestion or um, inability to eat. So even though I would go out to eat or try to eat my lunch, I would eat a couple of bites and I'd just push it away. With soccer coming up for the fall season, I just thought it was the pressure of putting together another winning team, another winning season, and that it was just stress and anxiety. Certainly, if a patient were to experience some of those symptoms, some of the first things that a physician might order are a pelvic ultrasound, maybe a CT scan. Honestly, it just went numb. Everything went numb. Uh, I couldn't even really think. I couldn't process it. Time stops almost. It slows down. And the world tilts on its axis. And you feel like you're in a snow globe. And it's been turned upside down. But you know that you have to ride it again because one of the people you love most in the world is going to be depending on you to figure it out. Who's at risk for ovarian cancer? There's a small component of patients who inherited a genetic mutation uh, from one of their parents. And certainly we know that there are numerous substances and environmental exposures and, and lifestyle factors that may each play a role culminating in the development of cancer. About 20% are going to be inherited, and about 80% are going to happen by chance. So yeah, there were those times when I was just thinking, I can't believe this happened to me. Uh, I, you know, this this doesn't happen to you know athletes like myself. Uh, but yeah, it was happening to me. Three to five years. I remember walking into the hospital room. And I told her that night after her mom and sister went home that if there was ever a time she couldn't fight the battle, I would put her on my back and I would wave. I'm so sorry. 
that I would fight it for her. And that's what we've done. They like to, I guess, do genetics to kind of further understand the history and how to treat it. So they did test me um, genetically to see if it was BRCA and it came back negative. But a couple years later, as we were going through different treatments, they tested the tumor and it showed BRCA positive. So then and that opened the door to a couple other different treatments I could do. The BRCA's tend to behave a little differently uh, than those who don't have the BRCA mutation. So that helps the clinician better prognosticate uh, the potential course of a patient's disease. Well, I was doing really well uh, for May, for June, and they had put me on a maintenance drug that would help me. But then about, I think it was January of 2017, it came back. I just thought, oh, I, I didn't want this for her. I didn't want for Kat to have to go through this again because she had already overcome so much. Finding Dr. McKenzie was a turning point in Kat's treatment. Hey, Kat. Platinum resistant means that after having received the standard first protocol treatment for high grade serous ovarian cancer, which almost always includes a platinum drug, if the cancer comes back six months or less after receiving a platinum drug, we tend to classify that recurrence as a platinum resistant recurrence. The drug binds to the surface receptor and through a, a fairly simple uh, mechanism allows for the drug to be ingested into the cell and then the payload is released and able to kill the cell. I knew going into this course of infusions was for recurrence and Kat's at an interesting place. She's a unicorn. And that was the other reason I knew Dr. McKenzie was the right oncologist for us being at a research facility. When I was first diagnosed, I had alumni and friends do fundraisers for me, so that was a big help. I'm so grateful and thankful. I've always wanted to give back. When I was at the university, that's why we started an ovarian cancer game, is to fundraise, to help research, and to help other women fighting this battle keep on having to be on a new regimen, a new series of drugs, and hopefully benefit from the greatest new drug. Today we're doing great. Um, saw Dr. McKenzie, I'm feeling good, starting to get back to the running and getting back to the working out um, as the fatigue isn't as debilitating. I am hopeful for the future. I'm involved in a few investigator-initiated studies myself, and I think that we are going to make headway in, in our lifetime. We're going to discover a lot, and we're going to make a difference soon. I think that um, the different types of immunotherapies that we have right now, um, the potential vaccines that are being investigated, the ability to use your own immune system, um, take it out of the body, make it better, bring it back uh, into your body, I think is also really exciting. Getting that good news makes you realize that, uh, again, life is a gift and you want to go out and be the best you can and, and show others that you you can win this fight, you can do it. If there are takeaways from Kat's story, women and patients, people need to listen to their bodies and they need to make sure that they are collaborating 
with a medical provider that listens to them. If we want to conquer the whisper disease, we have to do a better job of spreading the word as to what those vague symptoms are. Support and advocacy groups for cancer patients is a huge deal because without cancer research and thought through symptom management and supporting the patient and their caregivers, we're really, we're going to fall behind. For anyone who is a recently diagnosed ovarian cancer survivor or the caregiver of an ovarian <laughs> cancer survivor, it's going to be difficult and you can find joy from the very beginning. Look for the joy, laugh. The earth is going to keep shifting under your feet and you will learn to walk on it. You will find your balance and there will be so much good in the life that you have after 